I don't like taxes at all. Uh, but it's not a matter of what I like or don't like. It's a matter of what, what Alaska needs. Alaska, deeper in debt and edging closer to a fiscal cliff. A look at what's at stake. There's got to be other monies besides the permanent fund. I'm sure they're going to tap into it, but I just hope they don't take it all. For rural Alaska, the permanent fund is an important part of the economy. We take you to Dillingham, where low fish prices, the lack of jobs, and the prospect of a smaller dividend check have people on edge. Alaska leaders from years past are worried too. Although they come from different sides of the political aisle, they agree on one thing. Doing nothing is our worst enemy. Up next on Frontiers, staring down at the fiscal cliff, looking for answers. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by Kupik Corporation and Spinard Builder Supply. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program. Ever since statehood, one of Alaska's biggest frontiers has been finding a way to pay for state government. The discovery of oil seemed to be the answer, but over the years we've stared down many a fiscal cliff, saved from the brink by a rebound in oil prices. But the news from the governor this week went from bad to worse. Alaska's budget gap got even bigger by about $300 million. The reason? Oil prices have been in the $40 range, not the $50 a barrel forecasted last fall. And that amounts to about a 30% drop in revenue. We need to be thinking, you know, what's the vision of Alaska 25 years from now, from 50 years from now? That's, we have that opportunity now, and you're not going to do it by, you know, sitting back, you know, with the Ouija board, hoping the price of oil is going to go to $110 or $147. It just isn't going to work. Here's a quick snapshot of how crashing oil prices have changed the picture. In the last fiscal year, state revenue was about $8.5 billion, but in this current fiscal year, the forecast has dropped to less than half of that, down to $3.6 billion. The budget gap has now grown to more than $4 billion. The legislature can close it by digging into savings, but when that money is gone, what then? It's a question that raises fear in the Bristol Bay community of Dillingham, where times are already tough. Dillingham is between the seasons. The bay will soon be clear of ice, and the town will turn into a scenic fisheries hub. Right now, though, the picture isn't so good. Salmon prices are down for the second year in a row. That's the talk here at the Bayside Diner. Another big worry? State budget cuts and a potential drop in a major source of income, the permanent fund dividend. Steve Wassily manages this restaurant and knows how much its bottom line depends on permanent fund checks. When the people get their permanent funds, most of them will come in and shop and treat themselves to like a burger. <laughs> One of the regional favorites, what's known as the classic burger. Especially for customers from surrounding villages where jobs are scarce. Dividend checks have bought many a burger, along with groceries, fuel, and other basics. And there you go, classic burger, Bayside Diner. Did they tap the permanent fund? God bless them. What can I do? Steve Wassily understands the state's in big trouble, but... There's got to be other monies besides the permanent fund. I'm sure they're going to tap into it, but I just hope they don't take it all. Soon, these boats will be in the water and the streets filled with fishermen. This is a pretty busy port in the summertime. Rose Luetta is Dillingham city manager. 
she would prefer to see the state income tax reinstated because, as it is now, many fishermen do not contribute to the cost of city services they enjoy. A large percentage of our fishermen are from not from this region, not from the state of Alaska. They bring their groceries and such in in the summertime on the barges. Once the fishing ends, they pull their boats up and they go home. So and have take it their money with and them? take their money with them. Money that might help Dillingham do a better job of serving the people who live here. This is a very old cemetery. We don't have the money to uh, maintain them. You know, we have to make a choice between uh, maintaining our cemetery or public works. My friend. Or funding the Senior Center, which lost about $100,000 in city funds last year. Elders could lose more services in the next round of state budget cuts. The court system, though, was spared the budget acts this year after the governor reversed his decision to close Dillingham's district attorney's office. Here at City Hall, there's relief, but also frustration. What bugs you about what's going on in Juneau? The not knowing. Rose Loetta and Mayor Alice Ruby say lawmakers need to focus on the revenue side of the equation. We need to know what the state's plans are so we can make plans. We can't wait any longer. We can't keep dragging this on and saying, let's fix it next year, let's fix it next year. So far, the only fix has been cuts, with more on the way. Revenue sharing goes away. That's $130,000. That's um, our water program. PFD checks help take the edge off of high grocery prices, some of the highest in the state. But if the legislature taps permanent fund earnings, those dividend checks would shrink. All right, have a wonderful day. And if lawmakers also impose a statewide sales tax, which would come on top of a 6% city tax, shoppers would have even less expendable income, yet another hit to city revenues. It is a fiscal cliff. Mike Davis cliff. teaches government at the Bristol Bay campus, and he's also a former state lawmaker. Your prediction on what the legislature will do this session? You know what, my prediction is, is that they, they'll wait till next year, unfortunately. Davis hopes he's wrong for the sake of Dillingham and every community across the state. Many local government leaders say the legislature needs to do its job and do it quickly. Two Alaska statesmen agree, Tony Knowles, a Democrat, and Rick Maestrom, a Republican. They will tell us what they would do if they were in the driver's seat. At Spinard Builder Supply, we know it takes a lot of ingredients to get it just right. That's why we have design centers in every store to personalize the most important rooms in your home. We'll help you select cabinets, faucets, and appliances that fit your style. So all you have to worry about is how much oregano goes in mom's pasta sauce. Spinard Builder Supply. Building for life. Now offering financing with no payments or interest for 12 months. Visit our design experts today at your local Spinard Builder Supply. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium provides comprehensive health services for Alaska Native and American Indian people across our state. In addition to world-class care at the Alaska Native Medical Center, our work delivers health services for rural Alaska. From cutting edge technology for the best care possible to modern construction of clean water systems and health clinics to health training and outreach that honors our culture, our vision is that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. We taught him how to hit a baseball, how to hit a receiver. He even taught him how to hit the open man. But how much time have you spent teaching him what not to hit? Air travel for Frontiers is provided by Pan Air. When business or recreation takes you anywhere across the state, Pan Air is there. The only family owned airline serving Alaska. Pan Air, the spirit of Alaska. Football games never break out at the office. Hockey games either. Turns out covering sports in Alaska is not for the weak of heart or back. Reading highlights from sports feeds, easy. Getting the words out at 45 below, try it sometime. Dave Goldman goes the distance for every Alaska sports fan. Like him, KTBA 11 Sports and Dave Goldman. They've 
sometimes disagreed with each other in the past, sometimes very strongly. But this week, a group of former governors and lieutenant governors found a lot to agree upon. The longer that we wait, the fewer options that we have. Each year has been involved in Alaska politics long enough to see the state go through several recessions. Governor Bill Sheffield's administration was marked by massive layoffs after a prolonged downturn in oil prices back in the 1980s. But even then, the budget deficit was nowhere near $4 billion. We need to act now. If we wait and put this off until next year, it will be in serious trouble. There's definitely a consensus that we need to start using the permanent fund for what it was intended to be used for. We also believe that that's the only way that you can actually save the permanent fund dividend. Because if you just do kind of a stopgap measure right now, you end up burning through your reserves in just a few years. We cannot afford the level of government that we have right now. So it's a combination of cutting the budget, it's a combination of taking a portion of the permanent fund earnings, and it's a combination of increasing taxes. I Governor Frank Murkowski joined the conversation by video conference, and while he emphasized the need to downsize government, he also agrees with the group. The state needs some new sources of income. Just the fact that we achieve consensus on some basic principles is progress. The Rasmussen Foundation brought the group together. Well, our guests have ridden the roller coaster of oil prices several times, enough to see the cycle of ups and downs in the economy. Now, both have served as mayor of Anchorage, and Rick Maestrom was a mayor during a critical time, and Tony Knowles, also a former governor. And a lot of people have been looking at the economic tea leaves, trying to figure out if we're about to see a repeat of the 1980s recession. What do you think? Are, are we on sort of a tipping point? Well, certainly we could be in that situation, or maybe even worse. It depends on what we do. If we do nothing about that $4 billion deficit, we will eat through two of our savings accounts within the next couple of the three years. Uh, it will be our constitutional budget reserve and our permanent funds earnings reserve. When that happens, it will initiate an economic disaster. A veritable state bankruptcy will mean no more permanent fund dividends. It will mean a junk bond status rating for state and local governments. It will mean private investment fleeing the state, a loss of jobs in the private and the public, se and the public sector, and a decimation of services. Well, let's take that, a look. That's, that's what it'll be. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, let's take a look at some of the 1980s recession numbers, you know, the job loss that occurred in just a two-year period. Rick, what are your memories of, of this recession? Dramatic. Um, in 1986, uh, alone, Anchorage lost 13% of its population. We lost 25% of our assessed valuation. And the biggest homeowner in Anchorage was Mortgage Guarantee Insurance Corporation of America. People just left town in droves. So what was the real blame for this? Was it the low oil prices or the sudden withdrawal of state funding? It was a combination of, of bad decisions on the part of the governor and the legislature. They tried to cut everything that one year. They, they saw it coming, and so not only did we have less revenue from oil industry, but we had less money in circulation from the state. And Alaska is different. Uh, we are one of the only, well, the only state in America that government is actually uh, a, a revenue driver. It's actually, it drives, helps drive the economy because the money's already been taken out of it. So we've got to be careful. We don't exacerbate the fact that the oil is, industry has cut $1.2 billion. And if we cut another $800 million, that's $2 billion out of our economy. We don't want to do that this year. Well, you know, when you were governor, Tony, I remember you saying that, you know, we, we wanted to treat the economy like an airplane, that we didn't want a crash landing. Do you think that this applies today? Well, uh, when serving as governor, I know we went down to $9 a barrel. And we were the only state in the country at that time, which was going through the late 90s IT boom, uh, that had to reduce its budget. And it was difficult, but we did manage to do it. And yet we still had to come up with a plan, which had very little support, but a plan that to use some of the earnings from our permanent fund in conjunction with our constitutional budget reserve to help <coughs> offset 
uh, the dramatic economic times that we thought lay ahead. Well, Fortunately, the price of oil went up, so it fixed the problem. And maybe that's the problem, is everybody thinks government is crying wolf, and they tune it out. But, but Rick and, and Tony, you each have a plan, so let's talk about your budget fix, Rick. Okay. It's based on some short-term and long-term proposals. Mine, in the, in the short term, and I have specifically said short and long term proposals, we need to consider the general economy. And if we, if we cut back things right now at the same time the oil industry is cut back, we're in for some problems. So we need to use permanent fund earnings reserve, uh, constitutional budget reserve, and begin using that this year. But at the same time, long term, in order to get government down to where it should be, we've got to find some way to attach the cost of government with people's pocketbooks. So in other words, the tax taxes that might be imposed down the road would fluctuate from year to year based on the, what? They'd fluctuate based on, and I, I don't know if they'd fluctuate year to year, but they would go up or down in general, uh, whether it's every two years or so, based on the cost of government. And then you'd find Alaskans really concerned about how much government is spending. Well, Tony, and that would help. Let's take a look at your plan. Yeah. Well, Rick is absolutely right in terms of using the wealth that we have, thanks to decisions made decades ago, to have a permanent fund. We also have an earnings reserve and a constitutional budget reserve. They total $60 billion. And if we use just the earnings from that and say 5%, which is done by foundations all across the, uh, the, the nation and it's sustainable, we will have, after inflation proofing, after a sustainable permanent fund dividend, we will still, we will have $2.7 billion we can put against that deficit. That means we still need cuts, we still need taxes, corporate and personal, if necessary, to balance that budget. But once we balance that budget, what we will have done is a historic event that no other state in the nation has done, is to go from having a boom and bust cycle dependent on a non-renewable commodity resource, oil, to a permanent stable budget that's balanced from the earnings from our wealth. No one else can do that, and that will be our moment in history. We don't need to leave a train, economic train wreck as our legacy. We can have a choice if we do the right thing now. Well, we've got lawmakers, particularly in the Senate leadership, that say, you know, we've made our cuts. Let's stop there. Let's tackle revenues next year. What's your assessment of that strategy? We can't, we can't do that. You can't cut enough to even begin to make up that $4 billion uh, shortfall right now. So you have to deal with, with revenues. And what Tony says about simplifying the whole permanent fund use and, and use 5% of it to distribute every year. And that's the way the Rasmussen Foundation works, and I was on that board for 13 years, and the way every other foundation works. Uh, we've got we've to simplify it. You know, you can't explain to people exactly how it works because it's so complicated. Uh, and so we need to simplify that, make it 5% of the basic body of the permanent fund that we can use, and then at the same time work on a way to associate uh, the cost of government with people's pocketbooks. Tony, you, you know, have counseled that now is not the time to delay. Does that really worry you? You know, maybe that there's an election year ahead, lawmakers don't want to be uh, lambasted for uh, raising taxes? Well, kicking the can down the street to be addressed later is a political decision, not an economic decision. What it basically means is they say that we can eat our seed corn. And every dollar that then is taken out of a savings account and consumed by addressing that year's deficit takes away the earnings of that money for in perpetuity could give us a stable, balanced, sustainable budget. And that's the gift we need to give to the next year, not from a political decision, but from a care about the Alaska's future. Well, one of the things, and we have just a little bit of time, is you know we need some money to pay for a gas line. We've got to have some money. Do you feel that if we don't find other sources of, of revenue that we may jeopardize that? It'll, it'll make it more expensive for us to borrow the money for the gas line, but I don't think we'll jeopardize the gas line. I think the governor and the legislature and the people of Alaska want to see that happen almost universally. There's few that don't. 
Uh, and I don't think it will jeopardize it, but it will make it more expensive for us if our, uh, if our credit rating goes down because of this. Rick, Rick is absolutely right on that. What we can do is with the uh, economic foundation of the wealth of this state, we can address those issues because we're in good, we have good credit. And we won't have good credit if we've eaten through all of our savings accounts. And that's where that if we don't balance our budget now, and we, we uniquely among anywhere have the ability to do that, then we jeopardize all the future good things that could happen. See, I have one bit of disagreement with Tony there, and that is I, we, have to, we have to work at balancing the budget. I don't think we have, I think we can take the biggest part, if not all of it, out of the earnings reserve this year, take a little out next, a smaller amount out next year, smaller amount the year after that, and gradually get down to where it's self-sustaining. Uh, I don't think we have to presume that if we take $4 billion out of the constitutional budget reserve, we have to do that every year. I don't think we have to. But we can start, we can start providing other sources of revenue and cutting. But I don't have a big problem with solving that problem this year with using money from the permanent fund earnings reserve and the constitutional budget reserve. Take some political courage. Well, we want to thank the both of you for giving us your take on how to dig our way out of this budget deficit. Up next, Alaska's rainy day fund. You've got to remove the money, put it behind a rope where you cannot utilize it for flamboyant expenditures. That's why Governor Jay Hammond in 1980, a time when cash and oil flowed freely. I do think a fundamental question for Alaskans in particular is, what is the permanent fund for? I'm Liz Raines. Coming up, we'll take a closer look at this question, how conversations from the past are echoing into our state's future. We have a story. A story of 27 families that put 18 months of their lives into building a village, a home for themselves and their future. Our Inupiaq culture goes back thousands of years, carried by a strong sense of community. Our relationship with our natural surroundings is at the heart of our culture. By investing in future generations through development that is balanced with the love of our land, the Kupi Corporation brings together traditions of the past with visions of the future. I just want cremation. Cremation specialists in Alaska. Can I have a service before cremation? Our staff is committed to serving your needs. I just want something basic. The simpler, the better. Specializing in simple cremations. Whatever your reasons are for choosing cremation, call Cremation Society of Alaska, 277-2777, or in the Valley, 373-8627, and on the web at alaskacremation.com. You know, you have a choice these days of whether you're going to put gas in your car or feed your kids. If you're going to put gas in your car, you're going to be able to go to work, which you're going to be able to feed your kids. But you still have to make a choice at the end of the month when you don't have anything. There's an old saying, you won't find news in a newsroom. And you won't find Joe Vigil there if he can help it. To say Joe gets around is an understatement. We came down here See, he's not the kind of anchor content to just read the news. Fly from Portland to Washington. He'd rather be out here where the news lives. Joe Vigil and KTVA 11 News. Be there. Dealing with budget gaps is not new for state lawmakers, but never have they had one so big and so much pressure to use earnings from the permanent fund to save the day. KTVA's Liz Raines has had a front row seat on history this session and takes us back to a time when the fund was first created. For decades, the Alaska government has lived on oil, a black blood circulating through the veins of communities and pumping prosperity into the heart of our state. It's the wave that we've ridden up 
and down, but the price of oil is pulling revenue under. Reports show oil will bring in $300 million less than expected next year, just over $1 billion to fill a budget that's closer to five. So when there's a shortage in the lifeline, how do you survive? Is that we have reached a point in our, in our uh, in our state's history that uh, we need to be looking sort of beyond oil a bit. Lawmakers and the governor are turning to the reserves. And so uh, the first thing we do is use our sovereign wealth. What is the wealth of the state of Alaska? How do you include people in it both by uh, the benefit and the, uh, the downside, which is there's less money for everybody. Some plans include use of only the permanent fund's earnings, but that means lower dividends. I do think a fundamental question for Alaskans in particular is what is the permanent fund for? Cliff Grow helped shape the dividend program back in 1982, a novel idea at the time that's now sparked a uniquely Alaskan conversation. I did not understand back in 1982 when I was working on this legislation and helping create the program how important permanent fund dividends would come to be for some families, particularly um, in, in rural Alaska and among some lower income families. Alaska is in a very different economic situation today than it was in the early 80s, but many of the conversations about the permanent fund are echoed here in the halls today. You've got to remove the money, put it behind a rope where you cannot utilize it for flamboyant expenditures. That's why government grows so fantastically and why the public, as I say, have bought so much of it, we sold it to them too cheaply. Governor Jay Hammond said then what many are worried about now. Government has grown, and will it continue to grow if lawmakers start using a new pot of money? Some of the proposals in the legislature have introduced spending caps to promise the public that if oil bounces back, the state will stop drawing from the fund. For oil revenue over a billion dollars, there's a corresponding reduction in the percentage of market value draw. The desire to find alternative cash cows beyond oil is deep-rooted. Revenue Commissioner Tom Williams warned of placing too much faith in the oil industry back in 1980. We need to develop the non-petroleum activities of this state, and we must use the wealth that we have today and tomorrow to, to make sure that we have the wherewithal for our children. The permanent fund is a new horizon. It now has the ability to serve as a lifeline for Alaska without touching the corpus of the fund. And this is an opportunity we had not had before because at the last time we were in, 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 in this situation, the mid-80s, you know, the, uh, the permanent fund was much, much smaller. So, so now we can, we, can, we can look at using it a bit differently. So. The decades-old goal of diversifying the economy still resonates with our government today. Someday the oil may dry up. Decisions made now could keep the state from going over the edge of a fiscal cliff and on a path to a brighter, safer future. Reporting for Frontiers, Liz Raines, KTVA 11 News. Dealing with a fiscal crisis of this magnitude surely is a frontier. With political courage and statesmanship needed now more than ever. We want to thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.